Okay, and recording has started. We're recording, everyone. <laughs> so, All right. yeah, we can go ahead and get started, Matt. All right. Welcome, everyone, to Service Hour Community Q&A number 42. We've already had some good hitchhikers jokes, so that's, that's well in keeping with the community. So thank you for that. Um, as usual, um, ask questions. You can ask questions on the mic. You can type them into the chat window. But we're going to pull a few out from other forums that we found. Um, as always, uh, you know, I'm Matt Snyder. I'm one of the PMs on Service Fabric. Um, and I'm here to answer your questions. I can also do general updates. Uh, so we'd like to talk about what we've been doing on the team lately. Uh, so just in terms of that, uh, I think some of you have seen we've had a bunch of updates go out lately. Um, so a lot of these are minor bug fixes on top of 7.0. Um, so you can check out those uh, release notes. If you go to the tech community site, which I will dump into the chat window for completeness. Um, so there you can see we had 7.0 and then we had a bunch of updates. Uh, each of those should have good release notes. If they don't, please let us know and we can go and make sure that we're describing what were changes. Most of those were small uh, fixes that we saw based on what people ran into stuff in production. Uh, so we like to get those fixed and roll, rollouts applied uh, to environments as quickly as possible. Um, in terms of other stuff that's going on, uh, we announced uh, a preview of the Service Fabric Reliable Collection Backup Explorer. Um, so those of you who have been around for a while know that that's been a, a long-standing ask. Um, so what you can do with it, it's in preview still, but please give it a shot and let us know what you think. Um, but it gives you that long-awaited ability to manipulate your collection information offline. So if you take a backup uh, and you store it somewhere, you can open up the backup, you can uh, edit it, you can look at the data that's in there um, and save it back and then re-import that uh, backed up data into some other service. Um, so we see this useful in emergencies, clearly. Um, if you're trying to keep you know, multiple stateful services consistent, uh, they're all taking backups at different times. And sometimes when you go look at those backups, you find that one service has some information that another service doesn't have. And so you need to either like unwind uh, a service or you need to uh, compensate and put other data into a different service. Now with the Backup Explorer tool, uh, you can do that. You can also just use it, uh, you know, we like to use it to um, view the data in the collections. Uh, so it's useful to extract um, uh, statistics or things like that uh, from the environment so that you can create maybe simulated data or uh, other things and then import that into uh, a test environment, let's say. Um, so the, the Explorer is now out there, and uh, I, I know that it's a thing that people have been asking for for some time, so give it a shot. Uh, I can grab the link to that and put that in the chat. It was actually, we open sourced it a few days ago, but the or maybe like a week ago, but the announcement just came out. So <laughs> there you go. Um, so that's the announcement that has links to the source code, and uh, you can find it on GitHub and get a hold of it. So is the service fabric volume driver still there? It has suddenly disappeared from the documentation. That's interesting. Uh... Oh, hey guys. Hey, Matt. Hey, Nathalie. Hey. Uh, what vo volume driver is missing from the documentation? OK. <laughs> OK, I'll follow up on that. <laughs> That's... I know the, the Azure Files one oh, is still no, there. No, I think we we just only remember announcing it as part of Mesh for support for Mesh. But I don't know if we had anything for Service Fabric. Um, um, yeah, I, I still know. see it in the Mesh docs, but I yeah. don't know if there was a separate one. So, for example, I still see it here. Uh, I I don't think we have one for Service Fabric. We know we did for Mesh in uh, like a preview, but uh, maybe we had it in the roadmap for Service Fabric, but then later. Yeah, Marcin, if you got a if you got a Wayback Machine uh, snippet showing me where you think it should be, 
um, send it over and we can we can figure out what's going on. Uh, oh, okay, we'll try to find it. And yeah, uh, and it was uh, like it was mentioned on some uh, ignites and builds and stuff like that. And uh, there is no uh, uh, no word about this. And I and I see that there was a huge amount of work put into this driver, like uh, the yeah. system driver. It's like, like a huge, enormous feature. So what is the status? Is it internal only now or? What's going on? <laughs> yeah, so I, I can I can talk a little bit about what we're trying to do generally. Um, so we built out the driver in anticipation of um, you know needs for mesh, and as we have not been making a lot of progress on mesh, the driver itself just kind of reached a point and sat there. But that doesn't mean that we think the scenario isn't interesting or valid. Um, so one of the things that the driver was going to give us was this sort of language independent uh, state store. So you just, you know, you write to a block store and um, that takes care of it. So you can do that from any language. Um, that's still an important scenario. And we're looking at uh, either the block store or maybe another intermediary like Dapper as a way of getting that language independent uh, storage of state. There is also the Azure Files based volume driver. Um, that we see uses of uh, just in in service fabric and Azure generally, um, and that one is also so far meeting most people's needs. So what we're trying to figure out next is, you know, in order to get some of this language independence and in order to make it so that uh, you can containerize basically any application and and deploy it in an HA way. Um, is the is the files back driver sufficient, or do we need the replicated block store type driver um, more generally, or for different kinds of workloads? And that sort of still is getting figured out. So for right now, we haven't been so doing a lot of work on the driver, but it doesn't mean that the scenario has gone away. So my use case is actually for on premises. So mm -hmm. I am. I want to deploy some machines on premises in the office for development scenarios, for developers to run containerized version of our software, and they need some data persistence for the containers, right, for mm -hmm. their workplace. And uh, today, uh, the only solution I see on the market that might work is unfortunately Kubernetes with Rook. And I don't like Rook at all, but I got it working and I was thinking that it would be much nicer to deploy just service fabric cluster on premises and uh, use the volume driver for that purpose. Does it make any yeah. sense to you? Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, I think, you know, that's a gap today. Um, but again, it's not, it's not out of intention, right? It's just we haven't really figured out how we want to provide um, that capability that you mentioned. Also, you know, we, we do know that on-prem, a lot of people still have, you know, SANS, uh, and like it or not, mounting just local things into uh, a local volume that's, that's actually backed by a SAN works pretty well. So we're trying to figure out, based on the workloads that we see, um, how many people really need those um, highly available local stores. It's also a case where we were thinking about the block store, as you mentioned, um, as a, a bridge. So I could deploy it on-prem and then the same application would work if I deployed it in service fabric in Azure and I wouldn't have to change really how things work. That's also somewhat true for um, the file-based driver, the Azure files-based driver, but it's more likely that you'd uh, you have more different performance characteristics, for example. Um, so I think this is good feedback. Do let us know if we can figure out if something did actually disappear, couldn't be disappearing. So we should go figure out what happened there. Um, okay, I okay. I mean, is, yeah, I think part of this is just that we're still trying to figure out, you know, how many, how many workloads are in this sort of scenario and what, uh, what capabilities do we need to provide out of the box um, for these scenarios. And that, that's still an ongoing conversation. 
and clearly like the space is evolving uh, pretty rapidly, right? I mean, uh, when we started the volume driver, I don't even I don't even remember if AKS existed then or you know certainly Rook didn't exist, um, Dapper didn't exist. Uh, we cared only about .NET and Java, um, and so some of these scenarios have changed, and we have to go back um, and formalize our thinking, and then come up with a plan for what to do with these things. We, I, I personally think it's a great piece of technology. We just need to figure out what to to do with it in terms of, you know, what what needs does it meet and uh, how do we get it out there for people to use? So, um, I think it's you, not you, only uh, great; it's also unique. <laughs> it is unique. I mean, it's also unique in the sense that I'm not even sure how many plugins like that are supported on Windows, let alone storage providers. So, um, <laughs> that's something that I mean, it's, it's another thing that we're also working closely with the uh, container org kind of in Windows to figure out, you know, is this something maybe that they should own and manage um, as a part of the overall containers on Windows story. Um, so these sorts of things are, are conversations that we're having. I just don't have a lot of uh, progress to report for you, unfortunately. Um, okay, and, and you mentioned Dapper. How is the progress of service, fab service fabric Dapper integration? Is it uh, going on? So we're not doing anything formally right now. Dapper kind of came out in the middle of a, Microsoft has these semesters that are roughly six months long. Um, so Dapper was not in our current semester's plans to integrate with, but um, kind of, as I mentioned, as a part of this story about Java and Linux and other languages, um, as a part of this, you know, maybe what do we do with the block store? As a part of these conversations, we're, we're definitely talking about Dapper and thinking about how can we use Dapper uh, as a bridge so that more of these language or more of these features that Service Fabric has can get exposed into different languages? So there's some prototyping work going on right now. I think you might have seen Leon's uh, you know, private reserve branch of Dapper that he's doing some of the integration with SF. Um, but I don't think we have any formal plans yet. Um, probably in the next month or two, as we reach the end of uh, this semester, and start planning for the next one, which goes roughly from, say, June to December, um, there will probably be more clear plans about, about what we want to do there. OK, so one last question. Sorry for hijacking this. Uh, OK, I'll get to Wit. But, Wit, I see your question, and we'll get to you in a second. <laughs> uh, so one, one question, so one last question is, uh, I really love uh, the new reliable collections v3 the one with uh, prefix searches snapshots it's like just everything i was missing there so it's like awesome yeah we were, we were listening it turns out and and <laughs> yeah it's like wow it, it's like just wow and uh and there was this project to run these reliable collections out of service fabric just for compatibility is it still alive? Is it going to happen? Because I would really love to use this. <laughs> yeah, same same sort of answer. It, it's all wrapped up in the um, what do we provide as a service versus what do we provide kind of as a library, and it's also related to uh, the question around do we do Dapper, Block Store, Collections as a library? Um, these things are all related. And, and we don't have, similarly, we don't have a clear answer yet. Um, we, we realized that we had, we were tackling the same problem in a bunch of different ways. And I think what we're doing is we're trying to take a step back, think about the scenarios, think about, you know, use cases like yours and try and come up with something holistic or at least be able to describe um, if we have Dapper, collections as a service, collections as a library and a block store, when would I tell you to use which? Right, and we didn't have a clear story there. Um, so I think we're in a you know period of reflection, <laughs> which is good because we're all locked in our homes, uh, figuring out kind of what do we want to carry forward? What is the strategy? Which of these 
is the options that we would recommend and in what uh, conditions. Um, so you're right that, and I'm actually going to take a note, though I'm sure Colby is actually also keeping me honest, um, about uh, block store, library, uh, dapper, uh, and some other things that we need to come up with formal stories for um, and either get in the plan or say this isn't in the plan for the time being. I, we're also working, this is just a general bookkeeping thing that we need to get better at. We're trying to get better at talking about the major features and things that are currently being worked on. So like when we do one of these semesters, um, it'd be nice if we put up a list of sort of the major features or things that we were working on. Um, we don't do that particularly well today. We try a little bit in a bunch of different places, but it's hard. Um, and so we're working and getting better at communicating what we're actually working on so that you can see, for example, oh, the block store work is currently, you know, paused pending uh, this sort of design discussion. Um, so that's something that we're going to be able to tackle because it's, you know, it's just documentation and it helps us describe what we're working on and you see what we're working on so you can provide us feedback. Um, so that's something we're going to be improving. Awesome. Thank you so much for answer. No, uh, no problem. More questions coming, but in chat, I will let someone else. Yeah. Know. <laughs> pause, pause the thread and yeah, yield for a second and we'll, uh, we'll get some other folks. Um, so, uh, with uh, a number of really useful scripts in DevOps to deploy service fabric to Azure based clusters, they're really being done to provide similarly useful functionality via GitHub Actions. Um, so, this is another thing that we're evaluating. Um, actually, we're, we're dealing with GitHub Actions in a couple of different ways. Um, but I don't know, is Peter? Peter's not here. Um, or maybe not that he, if you happen to know. I don't think we've started working with GitHub Actions yet, um, but that is something overall, this whole Azure DevOps and GitHub and GitHub Actions story has got to get unified kind of from Microsoft. And I know that there's some discussions going on about that. I have no visibility into them. Um, so as that story evolves, I, I expect that some of these things are going to get unified, or at least there will be a story about everything that is in A must also be in B, um, and things will get sorted out then. This is another thing that kind of landed during, uh, uh, kind of on one of these milestone boundaries or semester boundaries. And so we haven't slated any work for it yet. Also, just strangely Microsoft stuff. Um, the integration in DevOps and uh, VS Tooling are actually separate teams, separate organizations from the Service Fabric Org. So the VS Tools is one chunk, and then the folks who did the DevOps uh, tasks are actually another whole group of people. Um, and so we're trying to coordinate across them to figure out, first of all, we want to continue to evolve the tooling and improve some of the things that are there. So uh, making it easier to deploy applications via ARM rather than via these imperative commands um, so that you have your, you know, your service and your app defined via ARM because more and more features are only lighting up if you've described your app in ARM. So like the, the MI integration requires that your application be described in ARM. Um, whereas your Visual Studio experience and your Azure DevOps experience don't do that via ARM. They don't generate the ARM. They don't speak ARM. Uh, so it's a little strange today. So we're working to improve the tools, but we're also trying to figure out who is the owner for that GitHub Actions piece if we go build it. Is it the SF team? Is it one of these other existing teams? And we're still trying to figure that out with our partners there. Um, so I think we, we have a desire to get into GitHub Actions and make that story make sense and work as well as the DevOps stuff does today. Um, but we don't have any work currently going on unless that team, who I don't know who they are, <laughs> uh, is already doing it on our behalf. That's kind of how we found out about the DevOps uh, side of things initially was a team just came out of nowhere, uh, cloned what the dev dev folks were doing and uh, made the, the uh, Azure DevOps stuff and lit up kind of overnight. Um, so maybe something magical like that is happening here as well. Uh, but we should dig in and, and, and find out. 
Okay. I guess uh, to, to follow up on that on a related note uh, regarding the ARM templates, uh, I guess, yeah, increasingly a lot of stuff is switching to using that. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the stuff that I've seen, I guess, maybe it's just unfamiliarity with ARM as a whole, but for the most part, I've seen that these ARM templates seem to just be written by hand. You know, mm -hmm. there's, there's, here's a, a, a GitHub repo with a sample template in it. Go forth and write it out for how it is that you want to make it work. And I've generally found ARM to be a real nightmare to, to manually deal with. Is, yeah. is there any real documentation coming along for how to actually go about generating these things? I, I haven't seen any. Uh, that's a Cause, good cause, follow Because once, once you have it set up, it's great. You can go in, you know, like a Azure portal, you click a button, it'll generate, oh, here's what you have, here's the, the template for it, until you need to change something. So, I mean, er everything does seem to be shifting to ARM, but it's a real nightmare to, you know, start from nothing and then produce that. Yeah, I, I personally agree. Um, I know that I tend to use Azure's Fluent APIs to get my environment into roughly the state that I want and then export the ARM resources. Um, there used to be a lot of issues, for example, where the exported ARM was not actually valid to feed back in. Um, a lot of that stuff has been cleaned up. Um, if you find any more, certainly if you find it in the service fabric uh, space, do let us know. Um, I don't know of anything cohesive there. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, yeah, I was just going to say, what we can definitely, um, I know that you're in the customer connection, and um, we can definitely follow up on this as Satya Vell and his team um, in our governance space there. Um, they may, I know that they definitely would have more guidance for you, um, or at least maybe some future promises to you on how ARM will be uh, less manual in the future for all of us. Yeah, I, I do know that it's a known, it's a known pain point, and you're not the only one to bring it up. Um, I've seen people you know, wrap around with Terraform. I've seen, you know, there's whole startups dedicated to like Pulumi uh, as a local company that tries to make things look more like code and then handle all of this generation under the hood. Sure. Um, I mean, that, that's, that's the, the imperativeness of, of PowerShell is great in that sense because it just, you know, it just works. It, right. It's familiar. You, you can say, just do these things. So it's been disconcerting to see service fabric kind of shift towards the ARM only approach. I mean, mm -hmm. MSI can only be lit up with uh, ARM templates. Yeah, and I mean, so some it's, of these, it's been some of these... comfortable seeing that when the, the tooling behind how to go about doing that at scale just isn't there yet. Yes, I understand. And, and I think I agree. Um, some of the reasons, hopefully you understand or, or can see the reasons why ARM is reasonable or yeah. ARM is a good choice. Sure. Um, yeah. But I think you're right that the tooling hasn't quite caught up with it yet. Um, we're kind of in a in that rough spot because we we do have more and more things that can only be lit up via ARM for for reasons. Um, so, for example, the reason that MI must uh, you can only use MI if the application is described via ARM is because the ARM definition is how the, the the different resource providers under the hood in Azure uh, use the ARM definition as a source of truth for how to do this secure handshake around what identities get propagated where. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't have that declarative definition, the resource providers don't have an API. They don't have any other way to tell them, hey, ferry this secure token from resource provider one to two to down to a machine. Mm -hmm. um, and it is unlikely that such an API is going to get built. Um, we, we're going to keep asking. But today, sure. if I want to get a token propagated safely down to a VM or into your uh, running service fabric services, ARM is the only way to describe that relationship that works. Um, and so with more and more things going kind of to this ARM is the truth uh, model, we are in a bind where we have to describe our stuff in ARM, which is great for a bunch of reasons. Like I get this, you know, we, we've always had this sort of uh, half-baked declarative service definition, right, in default services that kind of works. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it was always kind of strange because it was mixed up with your app type and upgrades were strange. Getting to a real declarative app and service definition is great. Um, because it lets you do these sorts of things repeatedly. But the downside is that, as you mentioned, 
I end up with these 5,000 line YAML files, right? Or JSON files. Yeah. And they're just really, really difficult to manage. Um, so I think we owe you a follow up um, kind of from the ARM team's perspective about you know the feedback they're getting and things that they're looking at in order to improve um, the, the management of large numbers of or just very large uh, ARM templates. And that should hopefully also alleviate some of this. Another thing that people run into a lot who are trying to move with service fabric is there's a there's a limit to the number of resources you can have in a in a group or in a subscription. Yes. And if you took, you know, we have customers with thousands of services in their cluster, you just can't represent them all as ARM resources because you start running into some of these limits. Um, so things like this are friction um, that we want to make sure the ARM team is aware of. And we're going to keep working with them to kind of alleviate some of this stuff. Um, so I think your feedback there will be appreciated. Great. Thank you. And yeah, sorry, I don't like these giant manifest things any more than you do. Well, especially the JSON is terrible because, you know, comments aren't valid. <laughs> so yeah, there's no comments. Like, and, why are know, we doing this? I don't, I don't know. know. Look at this and, other file. <laughs> and YAML white space matters, which I don't know yeah. who the hell came up with that idea. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of uh, angst, I think, around this right now. Um, and you're not the only one. So right. let, let's, let's do that follow-up and make sure that this feedback gets uh, taken in and we can see if those improvements uh, that they have kind of planned um, help out. And if they don't, then that's good feedback. Sure, I appreciate it. Hmm. Okay, the next question, I can read it. Um, do you plan to integrate service fabric metrics slash health subsystem, et cetera, as an exporter and open telemetry? Okay. But what is uh, open telemetry? Yeah, I, I don't think we have any plans for this at the time. Um, but that is another good example of a place where we could uh, pick up some uh, industry standards, let's say, right? Uh, but no, no plans at this time. Um, it's a good yeah, question. because before there was no industry standard for that, yeah. right? And now we finally have industry standard. <laughs> I think we're we're currently struggling with the five industry standards inside Microsoft. Uh, so. Let's build uh, sixth one to uh, integrate. Yes, exactly. It's, it's that XKCD, right? Yeah, there, sure. exactly. There are five standards. It wouldn't it be nice if there was one standard to unify all of them, and now there's six. Um, so I, I think we, we have our eye on this one. What we're currently dealing with monitoring-wise is we know that for uh, containerized services that some of the telemetry inside of Azure doesn't work or doesn't flow as well as we'd like. So we're working on that. We're also working on kind of the convergence story behind OMS, log analytics, all these different um, things that are in Azure today. We wanna to make sure that we have good guidance out there for how to use them, how to monitor your application regardless of the type of your application, how to monitor the SF system, um, things like that. And that story is getting improved. Um, and I think that that's kind of the motion that we're on right now. And then after that, we might evaluate something like open telemetry. Another thing that we're, we keep talking about but haven't done yet is um, event grid, right? Wouldn't it be great if every single time you created a service or created an app or created a cluster um, that an event was populated in event grid for that, right? We don't have that integration either. And that's another thing that helps with um, monitoring telemetry, observability, uh, stuff like that. So. I think we know that there's there's a bunch of work in this space that we could do uh, that we just haven't gotten to yet. Um, but that's another good example. So, so Marcin, one thing is that have you looked into Dapper because Dapper already has that connected um, has that integration with Open Telemetry? Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. I did a lot of with Dapper. <laughs> oh, cool, cool. Yeah, and then I think your your question is. I was I rather thinking that uh, because. Um, Open telemetry can have multiple exporters, and uh, one of those exporters can be just service fabric metrics. So mm -hmm. it's like a native because they will, uh, because uh, if you use Dapper, uh, let's say for example in service fabric, then it exports the uh, metrics in Prometheus format, and mm -hmm. this then 
service fabric needs to scrape metrics in Prometheus format. But okay. because the library is open source, instead, instead of uh, exposing metrics to be pulled by the Prometheus, it could push metrics to the service fabric metric subsystem. So uh, this is another approach to tackle this. So uh, just thinking loud about this uh, approach, because even Dapper integration can be simplified by adopting open telemetry as a open telemetry exporter to service fabric, right? Then, by the way, do you guys actually use Prometheus pretty heavily? I try to avoid Prometheus because I hate it. Uh, it's like uh, uh, 10 years behind service fabric help subsystem and stuff because it mixes up everything. It mixes different kinds of metrics for different purposes. It, 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 <laughs> Uh, it keeps some metrics for unreasonably long time, some metrics for unreasonably short time. It's like mixing up everything. In service fabric, everything is like it has its own place. It doesn't consume uh, consume eight gigabytes of memory, and it's just uh, everything is like on their own place, right? Uh, so we'll move on to the next question. So, uh, which is, what's the story of running service fabric behind an NSG? Um, yeah, so today when the runtime gets installed, we pull it down from the public download location, um, which is actually fronted by Akamai. And uh, so your IP ranges end up all over the place. Um, this is a known thing. Um, so we're working on allowing that to be proxied through uh, the service fabric resource provider in a region um, so that instead of having to whitelist every potential Akamai endpoint, um, instead you only have to allow the known that's Microsoft okay. resource providers IPs. Um, okay, so this is perfect solution, right? Yeah, that's one approach. There's another approach inside of Azure called service endpoints. We're looking to see if that uh, can be used to create this bridge. Um, but we we know that this sense, is a pain right? point. Yeah, there's a it's a it's connection. They are dead already. Dead on I, that's okay. <laughs> if it solves the problem, it solves the problem. Anyway, we're looking at these things, right? Because we know that this is a scenario that's busted. Um, but it, yeah, it's it's not there yet today. Uh, there is some work in progress, but I don't think it's there yet. Okay. Yeah, service tags is the other thing, right? Rather than service endpoints. Um, so that, that work is in flight. Um, I'm kind of always surprised that what is and is not a requirement. Um, I would have thought that something like service tags was a requirement, um, but it turns out you can ship for years and not have support for it. So that's probably gonna get fixed. Um, okay, Evgeny. Service fabric is not visible in any Microsoft marketing materials. Uh, true for third-party white papers. This affects the community. It makes it difficult to sell SF to management. Yep. Any chances the situation may change? Gosh, I hope so. Um, so this is a change that happened sometime in the last year. Uh, we can't, you know, affect third-party white papers. Um, if people write a story about container orchestrators and only write about the 12 flavors of Kubernetes that are out there, that's not something that the service fabric team can control. Um, but what we are trying to do is find an appropriate channel for communication um, through outbound marketing, community outreach, uh, stuff like that, where service fabric is mentioned in the scenarios where it makes sense. Um, we wanna make sure that people are picking up the right tool for the job. And we think that there are scenarios and, and markets where SF you know, has differentiated capabilities um, that can be used to solve you know, real problems. Um, we're going through that uh, strategy kind of rewrite now so we can describe to uh, the marketing community folks, you know, where service fabric fits in. Um, in the meantime, we understand that this is, you know, really problematic. And I think the only thing that we can give you, you know, which isn't great in the meantime is get in touch, right? The 
product team is here. We're doing feature work. If you need help making this pitch or understanding the pros and cons of different choices or are wondering you know, what Microsoft would recommend for your workload, reach out. You, know, you can certainly get in touch with me, um, any of the other Service Fabric PMs, and we can set up time and we're happy to uh, help make that pitch if you think it's, it's the right tool for the job. We understand that that doesn't scale, right? Uh, it, it's a drain on everyone's time to have to do this one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and so that's why we're hoping to make the, the full story, you know, public out there, described in a way that is consistent across the company so that the regular motions and communications flow like they should. I know that's not a great answer, but hopefully it's an answer. Yeah, it's the an answer. You're doing a great job. Uh, but without uh, Microsoft marketing machine, the huge marketing machine Microsoft used to push your products out to the market, that doesn't work very well. You are very great on technical level, but in order to sell something to company management, company management needs to get this message from somewhere else from some marketing presentation, from some conferences, et cetera, et cetera. And it's not happening. Yep. Zero visibility onto service fabric. People just don't know this term. Yeah. So yeah, that, I think that, that's a huge problem and it uh, just shrink your community. Yeah, I mean, so what we're doing Right now, our things under our control. We're trying to, you know, tweet more. We're trying to keep the community page updated. We have these calls, um, and we make ourselves available. But I, I think you're right, and we, you know, we agree. It would be good if the message was consistent from the company and came out through these normal channels on these regular cadences. Um, we're working to get back into those channels. Uh, we don't really fully understand what happened. Uh, for why we disappeared out of all of them, but we're going back and we're saying, hey, you know, this is a product, it ships, it's got these features, these are the scenarios where it's useful in, yeah, so it should be good. included in these uh, channels. But is there any product manager, any marketing manager who may participate in such session maybe next month and explain the strategy? I would... Uh, I would love to get one of those folks in front of them and in front of the, the service fabric community, and then you can all uh, tell them what you have on your mind. Uh, but I don't know that we can we can do that. I'd like to do that. That'd be that's an interesting idea. Maybe we can figure out how to do it. What, what's the yeah, I, Well, I, we we have to uh, convince them to take their time, and that's kind of the same story. Um, again, I think that this is going to get straightened out hopefully in the next couple of months. We're already starting to get back into some of the regular uh, field releases. When we have a, a big release like 7.0, it does go out. But what we're working on making sure happens is making sure that like we're in the Microsoft Azure training, uh, we're present in the field materials, we're present or at least have some presence in uh, conferences uh, that we're going to partner events. So just you know, full disclosure, there were a couple partner events that I was supposed to attend this month uh, to talk about, you know, how Partner X is using Service Fabric um, in their conferences, which are, of course, all canceled. Um, and so we're trying to get back out and do more of that community outreach. But that's still a, an outbound push just from the SF team. We're trying to make sure that marketing understands where Service Fabric fits in so that they can... Um, describe when customers should use SF, uh, sell it versus you know other options, understand when it's appropriate, and make sure that we're present and that the work that we're doing is uh, updated in those release channels, right? And that's the kind of stuff that isn't happening today that we need to get back into. And somewhere in the last year, I, to, a lot of these things we find out about later, right? You, you folks call us up and say, hey, you were in training X and now you're not in training X. What happened? And I didn't know we were in training X to start, right? We didn't get consulted about where we got put in or pulled out of. So figuring out who's making these decisions um, and engaging with them and understanding the rationale 
and then helping to provide them information so that we end up in the right places is kind of work that we're doing now to try and reestablish a lot of this stuff. So I think we hear you. I, I certainly hear you. And I understand deeply that that causes a lot of churn and FUD and all sorts of other negative consequences that we just don't want. Um, so keep keep asking, right? Keep asking and, and uh, hopefully we'll start to see some improvements in the next few months here. Could you recommend whom to ask else? Um, send me uh, a write-up, a description of the pain and suffering that this is causing, uh -huh. and I will start uh, searching around for the right contacts, right? I know that we talked to, you know, a director of marketing uh, who uh, isn't the person who does the work, right? But she can help uh, describe or maybe direct us to who we should be asking for directly. And I know that we are all, like right now, we are working with uh, some parts of marketing to figure out which of these channels we should be in. So those would be good people to send this on to and connect you with. Um, and I'm happy to do that for anybody else on the call as well. Um, I am. I will put my email address in if you don't know it already. And uh, let me make sure I spell Microsoft correctly. <laughs> Written on my shirt, and I should be better at typing it. But anyway, I, I think that this is good. This is good feedback. We know it's painful. Um, we can help make these connections and help drive the point home. But know that we're also working very hard to describe the scenarios and get back into some of these channels um, so that the right things happen. Thank you, Matthew. No problem. And hey, thanks Matt, for bringing I'd it up. To, um, I'd love to fit in. Um, Marcin's uh, question, or sorry, Andrej's question um, from the community who wasn't able to attend from AMEA, if that's okay right now. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, cool. Yeah, so he said um, that he was hoping that I could ask the panel about the future version of serv Service Fabric Mesh, um, aka based on the Atlas platform with support for the support for OAM, CNAB, et cetera, and whatever else Deep um, could share without facing a court martial. <laughs> um, so I don't know how much you can share Deep or Matt or whoever, um, but anything would be appreciated by him. And he'll be listening to the recording, I think you said. <laughs> Deep, do you want to take it or do you want me to take a swing first? You can take a swing and I'll follow up. Okay. So, I mean, I'll say broadly, this is a an area of intense investigation and work that's going on. Um, the mesh product as it is today, we haven't fully decided what to do with it. It remains in preview. Um, we're trying to figure out for the scenarios that it supports, um, how do we expose some of those capabilities in a more Azure-centric way? The feedback that we got about Mesh was largely that it was a really good model. People really liked it. But it, on the other hand, it didn't uh, solve the problem of really letting me represent my whole application. It could only describe the parts that were understood by SF. And people still felt coupled to SF, which is not what we're, we're aiming for. So that's where some of the work around OM came out and some of the work around Dapper came out is how do we describe applications in a more Azure-centric way? So if your application is you know, uh, two functions glued together with service bus, that's still an application. And you want to be able to represent that, um, even though maybe you don't deploy that to your service fabric cluster today, or maybe parts of those things do or do not run on top of service fabric today. Um, so that's kind of the direction that we're trying to head in. Uh, Engineering-wise, the Atlas platform is kind of the thing underneath uh, a lot of those Azure services or some of those Azure services today. And we're moving more things to it. So we're trying to build out support for the capabilities that uh, those partner teams need. Uh, so we've talked previously about how you know, Functions uh, is moving to run parts of their stuff on top of Atlas. We've talked about ACI. If we get ACI, we're talking about Kubernetes virtual nodes. So that'll bring in some more workloads. And we see more uh, partners moving over to this sort of environment. So our, our main engineering focus has been on growing and supporting that platform and less about figuring out how to expose the same mesh story. Um, 
we're also looking at things like as we move over ACI, um, what capabilities should ACI have to be a good primitive for these sorts of applications? Um, and do we need to put you know new capabilities into the SF runtime and then expose them to Atlas? Or are there already things there that we should figure out how to expose through ACI and maybe eventually through something like OM um, in order to you know get it into the hands of people and let you really describe your apps? Um, so a lot of that is still kind of ongoing. I, I, speaking as the SF runtime guy and Deep's the you know, Atlas environment uh, guy who just ships all my stuff. That's a joke. It's a joke, buddy. Uh, we're, we're trying to figure out this relationship both between the core SF runtime, the Atlas environment, and these actual services that people use on top, right? So I wouldn't tell you today to use Atlas. I'd tell you to use functions and ACI and, and some of these other higher layers, right? Um, and so the relationship between those higher layers and maybe a description that lets you talk about all of the higher layers together as your application is kind of the direction we're heading. Was that confusing enough, Deep? You got any more? No, I think that was fine. And I, I think the part that you said, which you claim is a joke, is also fair. I think it's not a joke. I think it's super important to call out that we're taking a massive dependency on um, the differentiators that we get from using a platform like Service Fabric to deliver something with the performance and density that we need uh, to run stateless serverless containers with scale at speed for the different solutions uh, that are taking a dependency on Atlas itself. Um, so yeah, lots of innovation coming. A lot of it I can't specifically speak to from a service perspective without the court martial clause. Um, but uh, as Matt said, I mean, if you want to talk specifically about the impact that it's having on services like ACI or functions, and please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my email is deep.kapoor, K-A-P-U-R at Microsoft.com. I'm putting that in the chat, but I don't know if the chat shows up in the recording. So um, get through to me and I'm, I'm happy to talk through it and yeah, answer yeah. any specific questions. And I think a lot of this is, we're, we're actively doing this work. This is stuff that's happening currently. So, you know, pardon the dust. Uh, we're, we're, we're making a lot of changes and also trying to figure out how these higher level services all fit together. So we get the, con the some of the mesh concepts like an application back at a Azure level, right? And naturally that involves all sorts of partner teams. Um, and so we're talking through this with them. It's not just about, hey, I exposed a bunch of things in OMB. It's about what is the scenario for building apps on Azure and what are the primitives that people wanna see and be able to represent? And, and that's work that is actively ongoing in conversations that are happening. So what a time. It's an exciting, it's actually really exciting <laughs> uh, for me anyway. Um, Wit had a follow-up question on common name support for the reverse proxy. I'll check in on that. Um, that, that should be a thing that, that shows up. Um, we did do, yeah, common name for clusters it's generally. Actually, actually, it sure, actually does ahead. show up in the ARM template. It just I think it, will also show up as say, unsupported. Huh. So if, if you attempt to make any change to it, it'll error out. Interesting. Maybe send me that or file a GitHub issue and send me the link. Sure. Um, and we can see what's going on there. I, I know that this is in flight. Um, so we might just be in a little bit of a torn state. Um, but that's something we can fix and follow up on. But yeah, uh, to your point and to Marcin's point, uh, the common name support really makes life easier. Um, some people have had, you know, pains getting to it. Um, the transition is not super simple, um, but once you're there, it makes it much easier to maintain secure clusters and rotate. Uh, Redeploying cluster is always simple. <laughs> yeah, you burn it down and start over, sure. That's what those ARM templates are good for. Um, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Hopefully you, hopefully you already have one generated. Start everything from backups <laughs> as yeah. it was to. Yeah, but I think we want to we wanna make it so that you can keep secure and keep up to date without having to burn things down as often. And so this, the common name stuff has really helped out there. Um, Back up on back up on attempt that they're running somewhere that is able to reverse proxy on the cluster and the backups. Yeah, so normally the backup or store service would be running in the cluster. And then that is taking the backups and sticking them somewhere. Uh, usually it's just blob storage in Azure. Um, and then if you wanted to 
muck around with the backup or look at it. You'd pull it out of blob and uh, edit it. Um, there is not currently a plan to make that editor or viewer uh, available in the cluster. Um, that's something that we could do over time, um, but it's not. I don't believe it's planned for that today. Sure. So I, I guess I, just looking at the even the config in there, it, it looks as though. I mean, I, I guess it's, it's unclear how you tell it where to find stuff. You know, you say, here's the app name, here's the service name. Where do you put the backup so it can find it? Well, it's it's going to go pull out a checkpoint, or at least that was the design. <laughs> I can see what they actually did. Sure. Um, so so I mean, even then, how, how does it find your, your cluster? I mean, what, how where do you define that? Yeah, I, I don't think it talks to clusters. It looks oh, at okay. the backup that was taken, which is basically just a checkpoint. Okay, so well, I guess where does it find that? <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good question. Uh, I can go look and see how they configured it. Sure. Um, I, I haven't done it myself yet. Um, I was only involved in the prototypes. Sure. Um, so I can go look to see how it actually landed. Um, unless anybody else on the team happens to know off the top of their head. Um, but that's a good question and we'll follow up. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Marcin, improvements in the multi-tenant story, managed by ARM and runtime isolation. Um, nothing really major there. I know that there's a lot of work going on to better support and make the MI story better. We're focused right now also, since the main functionality has landed, we're finally going to get that out of preview. So that's going to go GA, hopefully, fingers crossed, in the next month or two. Um, and then we're also working with the Azure SDK to make local development uh, via the access tokens better. Today, you kind of have to fork your code or have a, a branch where you figure out what environment you're running in and then access tokens slightly different way, uh, depending on whether or not you're running in Azure with real MI or on a local development environment or build environment. Um, so we're going to work with the Azure SDK and figure out how to make that pattern more first class so that you can get rid of that and get some of that friction out of your development experience. Um, that's uh, the next chunk of work that happens after we do the GA. So long story short, are you do you recommending disabling runtime access to the applications uh, when running an application in a multi-tenant environment? I mean, depends on if you trust it, right? I, if you So we even see cases where I have some workloads that I trust and some that I don't. And mm -hmm. for the ones that people don't, it's common to deploy that code, say, in a Hyper-V isolated container and cut off its runtime access. Yeah. Um, and, and in that scenario, how about re metrics reporting and stuff like that? Is it going to and health reporting? So you're, you're right. That's a gap because if I cut off the runtime access from this thing, then I can't yeah. uh, report. Okay. So. We're doing things like the Docker health check and okay. uh, readiness probes. The health check one's already there. Readiness is coming. Um, those turn into health events. We also okay. have uh, examples in things like Fabric Observer or uh, Cluster Observer that mm. are an example of a watchdog where you write a basically your own little probe logic and then that turns into health reports as well. We are, just to be very clear, also working on HTTP-based APIs for some of these things so that you can mm. report metrics on behalf of. Um, okay. There, and then there's also the, most of the Prometheus time- Prometheus format, probably. <laughs> we'll, 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 we won't go too far, don't worry. Uh, but the, the other thing to think about is for stuff like um, uh, resource consumption, Right. If you're using the resource governance features of SF, yes. then we're already looking at CPU consumption, memory consumption, and some other metrics for containers automatically on your behalf. Um, so you can go turn those things on, and you'll get metrics and resource governance uh, on the containers already. For doing it for a non-containerized regular service is harder, but also you tend to trust those. Um, so that's kind of the, the work that's ongoing there. I want to be conscious of the time. There's a few questions left floating around, um, and we're we're reaching that that lightning round part. Um, but yeah, so the the idea is that for most cases, 
we're doing the monitoring on your behalf. If not, then there are going to be multiple ways to watchdog or probe the untrusted workload um, so that I love you can get similar information out. Makes a lot of sense uh, and it helps me to solve some problem. Thank you for suggesting that sometimes you get uh, like in a dead end. Uh, and this mm. is a great solution. Thank you. Yeah. So I've seen people, for example, extend a Fabric Observer with a custom observer that knows to probe, you know, slash health on the containerized applications that you don't trust. And that reads some telemetry out from inside. Um, but the Docker health checks are already supported and result in health checks as well. Um, so something to look at. Uh, is OM a real thing? Uh, as far as I know, <laughs> I don't, maybe I don't know what you mean by real thing, but uh, it's definitely there. And we're trying to figure out how to continue to build out support for it. Um, depending on timelines uh, and how integration with that goes, we're also trying to figure out, you know, in partnership with some of these other Azure teams, <clears throat> what does it mean fundamentally to get applications uh, for Azure, right? And is the spec, you know, ohm? Is it a bunch more ARM? Is it client side? Is it a running service that manages things on your behalf? Uh, these are all active areas of investigation, and I don't think we have a final answer for you um, yet. And we're not, you know, we're participants, right, in that overall discussion. I can't decide if App Services wants another app concept wrapped over their app concept um, and extended out to SQL and networks and secrets and things. Um, that's one potential future. And I think we're working through with these other partner teams what those scenarios are and, and what they look like. Um, so that's that's where that sits. And Thanks. <laughs> My IM indicator is lit, but I don't know if it's questions in here. Uh, last couple of seconds, if you have any other questions or anything else you want to know, just go ahead and dump it into the chat room or uh, say hi. Otherwise, we can consider this a, a good number 42. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank um, you. Thank you very much. Job, Matt. Thanks, everyone. Yes, Thank I'll have so this much. recording posted on YouTube and everything, so everybody can reference it if you want um, with notes and everything. So, yeah, thank you, everybody, for attending our remote number 42. Yeah, what a time. <laughs> Everyone stay safe and healthy, and we'll see you in the next one. See you. Thanks. Thank Take you. Care.